pleasure for my life and I uh, to uh, be with you this evening. And we pray for you, uh, we stand with you, and we seek to encourage you in all you're seeking to do uh, for the Lord. I celebrated my 60th anniversary on the first Lord's Day of this month. Sixty years is a long time. Uh, but thank God for sinners saved, backsliders restored, and a church built that has an influence throughout the world. And we thank God for that. And best of all, a dear Roman Catholic man at the morning service closed with Christ and found forgiveness of sins and pardon through the blood of the Lamb. So we rejoice in that. I don't know where... Kyle will be 60 years in his anniversary. I'll be in heaven, I'm sure of that, singing in tune. I've sung out of tune all my life, but thank God I'll be singing in tune, tune in the day when I go home to meet with the Lord. I want to read with you a few verses from Holy Scripture tonight, from the first chapter of the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day, ending our lesson at verse 5, and God will stamp it with his divine approval, for it's own, it is his own infallible word. Let's stand for a word of prayer before we have the preaching. Father in heaven, we thank thee for these past 15 years of thy servant's ministry. We thank Thee for sinners converted to Christ, for backsliders restored to their first love, and for many of God's people who have been encouraged and helped, for those who were bereaved who have been comforted, for those that have been sick who have been healed, for those who have passed into dark valleys but have come out into the light we give thee thanks. Endure thy servant afresh with the power of the Spirit of God and use him in this area for the bringing of men and women to Christ. Send us a revival of true religion so that thy name may be glorified. And now for this service I take the promised Holy Ghost, the blessed power of Pentecost, to fill me to the uttermost. I take, thank God, He undertakes for me. And the people of God said, Amen. We may be seated. I want to speak tonight on a subject of great importance. It's the subject of the first day. And I have read the record of it from the Bible to you tonight. Could I say to you, there's something far beyond just the words of Scripture. Now every word of Scripture 
was given by inspiration of God. And every word of Scripture is infallible. This church stands for a Bible that we believe in and for a Bible we seek to defend and proclaim and preach. But you must also remember this, that though every word conveys its special meaning, meaning in the text of Scripture, that every word of Scripture has also a word with its own spiritual fitting into the great gospel economy. And so in Scripture we find the unveiling of mystery because this book is the mystery of God. Now I believe that what we read actually took place and I believe that in the beginning God did create the heaven and the earth. I don't believe a word in evolution. Once I was a tadpole beginning to begin, then became a frog with my tail nicely tucked in. Then a monkey up a banyan tree and I a professor with a PhD. I don't believe any of that stuff. I believe the plain word of God. And what was said here is literal and it's true and it will stand the test of time and the test of eternity. But every word of Scripture is spiritually linked into the great economy of the Gospel. And this first day, which was the first day in the calendar of this pre present creational system in which we live, behind it there's a revelation of a mystery. And the mystery behind it is the story of grace and how God can give us all the experience of a first day. When we will come out of darkness into light and turn from the power of sin and Satan unto God. And I want to speak on that uh, tonight. Yes, there's history here. There's divine truth here in the very face of Scripture. But there is a mystery revealed. The first day is not only an actual day, in the calendar of this world, but it also spells out that first day in the Christian life. Now if you look at this portion of Scripture, it starts off, and it starts off with chaos and disaster and darkness and despair and doom. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of, the, of God moved upon the face of the water. Here we have the picture of a world, a world that had brought upon it the judgment of God. Now, there's not very much said about that in the Bible. But we have the clear statement of the Scripture that the world that then was, was destroyed. Both its heaven and its earth. Now, that is not the flood, because the world was not destroyed at the flood. The world was washed at the flood. The heavens weren't destroyed because the heavens were the medium from which the waters came in judgment. But before that, in the beginning, the first creation, there was a world system. I don't know what happened to that system, except I read 
In the scriptures there was judgment. But I do look at this verse 2 and it says, The earth was without form. The earth was void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. You'll notice this is a two-faced text. Maybe you've never noticed that. And you'll notice also that one part of the text mentions the depth of the darkness on the face of the deep. The Spirit of God did not work on the deep. The Spirit of God worked upon the face of the waters that were in the deep. As I sat and looked at that, I suddenly was awakened to the fact that God had to bury an old world because of some terrible wickedness that had come. And the Bible just hints at it, but that is all. But the Spirit of God came to the graveyard of an old world. The Spirit of God came to the waters. My Bible tells me the wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest, who continually cast up mire and dirt. And somewhere there, there was this terrible death, a terrible grave, but there came the working of the Spirit of God. And could I say that this confinement of the old world brought in a time of desolateness, it brought in a time of darkness, and it brought in a time of deepness. You just think about those three terms. Desolateness, darkness, and deepness. And here we have a picture of the grave of the sin of an old world. That is what my heart is like before God. And that is what your heart is like before God. There is the desolateness, the darkness, and there is the unfathomable depths of our iniquity. From the sole of the foot, the prophet Isaiah wrote, to the crown of the head, there is no soundness in man but wounds and bruises and putrefying souls. They have not been bound up or anointed with ointment. My heart lives in the darkness of this depth with all the mire and the dirt and the wickedness of a heart that's not in tune with God. Christ came to seek and to save those that were lost. And every soul in this house tonight is either a soul that was lost and has been saved by the grace of God or is a soul lost and still lost out of Christ without a Savior? What can it, can it be? 
like a ship without a rudder on a wild and stormy sea. We have here, first of all, this awful confinement pictured in these few words. But we have something else. We have the counteractment of the Spirit of God. What does it say here? It says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Not upon the face of the deep, but upon the face of the waters, which I have hinted to you uh, that that is speaking of sinners because the wicked are like that troubled sea. You know, if you go down this first chapter of Genesis, you will discover as you go on to other chapters that that word that we have there, the earth was without form and void, is really the word became, and is translated through Genesis largely with the word became. And something did happen to that first created world. It became void. It became into darkness and into the shadow of the deep. But God did not write an eternal obituary to us over that creation. God said, I will remake it. And so he did. And we have this counteractment of the Spirit of God. Upon the face of the deep, there came the power of the Spirit of God. Could I emphasize tonight that our only hope as sinners is to be the target of the Spirit of God working. It's only the Spirit of God can take us from the darkness into the light. It's only the Spirit of God can work the work of grace in a man's soul. Sixty years ago when I started my ministry on the Ravenhill Road at uh, the beginning of my ministry I had a congregation of 60 and after six months it was reduced to 30. I was making the most moving sermons of my life. <laughs> and I came to the conclusion that I better do something or I would be out of a job and removed in disgrace from the pulpit. So I decided that the best thing I could do was to go after the worst sinner on the Raven Hill Road. So I called my elders together and I said, General man, I want some information. Who is the worst sinner on this road? Now I said, I'm not looking at any of you men. This is not, it's not a personal thing, but I want to know. And I said, well, uh, give us a few days. So in a few days I reconvened that session meeting and I said, gentlemen, have you made up your mind? Yes, we have. He says, there's an old man, he's now heading on for 70. You'll see him every night. At half past nine, because the pubs then closed at that hour, kicked out of the bar. He'll be hopelessly drunk. He'll crawl up the road, and just opposite where our church was at that time, there was a little entry. And he'll go through that entry. And he'll go into a hovel of a house. And he'll lie down. And he'll sleep. In the morning he'll come out, he'll be washed, he'll be cleaned up, he'll have a good suit on him, and he'll go and take a very responsible place in a big business. 
in the center of time. And then he will come back, and immediately he gets back, he'll not eat anything, he goes straight to the pub. I said, when did they start this? They said his first time he was caught drunk was as a child of twelve. Now, with the drunkenness, there was all the other sins that followed from it. His language was atrocious, his attitude was atrocious, and his wickedness was seen and felt in the neighborhood. Well, I said, gentlemen, thank you very much. You have business to do, and so have I. We've got to get this man to Christ. Now, these men, these elders were decent, respectable men and good Christians. I knew a lot of things about the Bible, but they just looked at me in a very odd way. And I said, gentlemen, are we playing a Christianity on this road, or do we believe it works? If it works, that man can be made a trophy of grace. If it doesn't work, I'm out of a job. So I'm going to put God to the test. On that night. And one of them said to me, that's very dangerous. He said, don't do that. I said, well, I'm going to be dangerous. I'm going to be very dangerous. Uh, so we prayed, and I went after the big sinner. And one night, he walked into the church, to the amazement of the whole congregation. And he said, what on earth is he doing in our church? If they had invited them sooner, his career to hell could have been stopped sooner. But instead of being rejoicing that he had come under the preaching of the gospel, they said, well, it's strange you would come here. It wasn't strange to me, for I'd cried to God, and I was worried. My concern was that I was praying and nothing was happening, but it happened. He came. And I did a very foolish thing. I was only a young preacher at the time. I was ordained when I was 20, and I was just about 20 years old and six months at this time. I uh, preached at it. I filled my gospel gun every night with the hottest lead that I could find in the Bible. And boy, I let both bottles go off at that man. And he never moved. I thought one night I should really preach a sermon against liquor because that was his trouble at the heart of things. And I'll preach this sermon. It was a white hot sermon against the liquor traffic and the boozers. And he always said to me at the door, stinking like a distillery himself, he says it's a terrible thing that it destroys people. <laughs> but I prayed on. And one day... I was on the Ravenhill Road, and the lady came to me, and she said, Oh, I'm so glad I've run into you, Mr. Paisley. You know my father. I said, I know him well. This was the, um, the uh, sister or the daughter of the man that I'm referring to. Well, he has taken to bed. And I said, Do you know what's wrong with him? Well, she said, I do not. And when he got into bed, he said to me, I want you to get Ian Paisley here as soon as you can. I have something to say to him. So I said, well, that's very good, and I'll be there. And I went there immediately. And uh, she had erected a, a bed for him in the good room, as we used to call it, the front room, in those terrace houses. We were sitting together on the road. And I went into the room, and I looked to the bed, and all I could see was his nose. He had himself covered in, and he was covered over, and he had just his nose out to breathe. So I went up, and I says, I said, what's wrong with you? He says, nothing. I'm not sick. I said, what you're doing on bed? He says, that's why I have you here. Right. Well, he says, the first thing, shut the door. I don't want to hurt you here. 
that ain't about what I'm going to talk to you about. So I'll go over and I shut the door. And I pulled a chair over and sat down, called him by his name. I said, what are you in bed doing if you're not well? And he burst into tears. He said, no, I'm not well. He said, I'm not well in my soul. I'm a lost man. I said to him, well, I'm glad to hear those words from your lips. I have been preaching at you and crying to God for you, and you never saw how bad you were. Oh, he says, there's no hope for me. He says, the things I've done, the wicked sins I've committed, and the people that I have put down in my brutality. And he said, What's going to happen to me? Well, I said, I'll tell you what can happen to you. God can save you. And you can get every sin you've ever committed washed whiter than the snow in the blood of Christ. And you can become a Christian. Well, he says, that's what I need to do, and I'll do it. And he cried like a child and asked God to have mercy upon him. He confessed some of the most awful sins and crimes he had engaged in. And God changed him. And from that day to the day he died, he was a testimony to the saving power of God. I never needed to put in another announcement about my church. The people came to see the preacher that had got the greatest sinner in the road seat. And there he was in the front seat, his face beaming singing the old gospel hymns. And of course his drinking companion said it wouldn't last. In fact, that was a Monday, a Monday or a Tuesday, and they said he would never get over the Friday. Well, he got past the Friday. And then they said, it was coming up to the 12th of July, marches, and they said he'll never make the 12th of July and get drunk. He went to the field, sober, came back as sober as a just, a judge and it was alright and then the city would not make the other marching season on the 12th of August he made it and then he, they wouldn't, he wouldn't do the Black Saturday march and he did it and then he would never get over Halloween and he got over Halloween sober and then he couldn't he would never get up past Christmas he'd be back right he got past many Christmases what had happened God had seen him he'd been seen he was in darkness and in the shadow of death. He was like what said here in verse 2. But God said, let there be light. But that was not said until the counteractment took place and the Spirit of God worked in the darkness and the Spirit of God worked on that man's heart. And all of us who are saved have it a similar, we have a similar blessing. What great things the Lord has done for his people. And if he hasn't done it for you, he can do it for you tonight, my friend. Don't you go on carrying your sin and your baggage that will take you to hell. Get to the cross, kneel down, and cry out to Christ. For the Spirit of God is most certainly working on the face of the waters. We come from that kind of enactment of the Spirit to the commandment of God. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Let there be light. And what men and women need in their heart is the shining of the light of the Lord Jesus. He says, I am the light of the world. And you need that light to dispel that darkness. Now let me tell you something. Nothing else can dispel it but Jesus Christ. The preacher can't dispel it. The church can't dispel it. Baptism can't dispel it. No church Ordinance can despair the darkness. Can't be done. Try it and you'll feel. 
can't be done. But thank God, Christ can dispel your darkness. I don't know how long you've been in darkness. I don't know what dark things lurk in your heart and unsettled questions and sins that you wouldn't want anybody to know about. But this let me tell you, God can issue his commandment and he can say to you, let there be light and there'll be light. The light of God will shine in your heart. Don't trust in the church. Don't trust in your behavior. Don't trust in the things of the church. Come and meet Jesus Christ, who is the light of this world. And let him into your heart, into your mind, into your soul. God is here. And he's saying, let there be light. And there was light. Light is the exact opposite of darkness. And darkness is despair that leads on to damnation and the darkness of hell and judgment forever. Be in time. While the voice of Jesus calls you, be in time. If in sin you longer wait, you will find no open gate, and your cry be just too late. Be in time. But you know, when we come down these few verses, we come to the commandment. God commands this life. He says he has seen the light and it was good. If you go down that chapter, you'll find there were six days of creation and only one day God didn't say it was good. On all the other days, he said it was good and on the third day and on the sixth day, he said it was good twice. You read it carefully. But on the second day, he didn't say it was good. Because on the second day, he brought about the creation that divided the waters above the earth from the waters below the earth. And there was brought into being the aerial heavens that we have today. But you know, the Bible tells me that Satan took his resonance up in that area. He's the prince of the power of the air. And God couldn't say that day. It was good. For Satan had taken up his seat of authority. His usurpation of the power of Christ and the reign of Christ there. Of course, no one would have had any idea of that why one day he didn't say it was good. But on the other days, he commanded them. Oh, and it's a great thing when God comes into our life and into our homes and into our hearts and we turn away from the darkness and we come into the full light of God. What a thing it is to have God's light in your heart. Light in your heart, light in your conscience, light for tomorrow and the next day instead of staggering on in the darkness and going further away from God and God's peace and God's help and the wonderful friendship of the blessed Savior, you tonight can say with God, it's good. Oh, enter into the light tonight. There is light shining. The light of the glorious gospel of Christ, but it needs to shine into your heart. 
Yes, you want it in your neighbor's heart. You want it in the, the people you know's heart, but it must first of all be in your heart. The commanding light of God. But if you look again at this, you'll see that there's compartments here. There's a division here. And there's things that are divided here. Yes, the day is divided uh, from the night. And then when you go down a little farther in the passage, you have the, the divisions of the dry land and the sea. And then you also have the division of the waters above the earth and the waters beneath the earth. And in all of those things, there are five of them, God sees them. Those are the only things we read that he saw. All the other things, it is not mentioned that he saw them. But there's five things here that God saw. And every one of them has a symbolical meaning. You take your Bible tonight and have a look at them and God will reveal it to you just exactly what God is speaking to sinners about when he talks about these compartments. You know, we do not live today in a world uh, where there is a proper line drawn between sin and that which is not sinful. The lines of demarcation are being erased in our world. And that's a terrible tragedy. You know, I tremble for our children. I was brought up as a boy in a Christian home, but I was also brought up in an age when the commandments of God were reverenced. For his day was kept holy. For the Lord's day was different from any other day. But all these things are now erased. There are two things that come from the unfallen world. The Sabbath day and the institution of Christian marriage. And those are the two things the devil is seeking to destroy today. The difference between the Lord's day and other days. And the foundation of society, which is Christian marriage. And we can see the erasing of these things day after day. God here in this text of scripture in a remarkable way reveals the compartments. There's a place where sin has to be kept back and where the truth of God has to prevail. And that's why we have to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the sin. I get a very, a very good write up about that. They say I am a troublemaker. And I always say, well, there's things that you have to make trouble with. You can't make peace with them. And if you don't like it, you just have to lump it. I've got to be honest to the Christ I serve. And when his word is rejected, and when his truths are neglected, and when people attack his commandments, I have to stand up for Jesus. It's my business. I can't be say I'm faithful to the Lord and then when the Lord's name is taken at me I remain in silence there is a battle to be fought and we see clearly in this portion of scripture that great divide but there's something else which is very peculiar here we have this looking of the Lord the Lord saw and I've already referred to it. As a great thing 
when the Lord looks down and sees the result of his own word at the hearts of his people. And if I would want anything for my church members, I'd like them to be a holy people. I was in uh, with a bank manager one day uh, seeking to do a job for one of my constituents, and he said this to me. He said, Ian, I want to tell you the free Presbyterians that I have in my bank are my customers. He said, I want to tell you, you should be proud of them. For they're honest and they're decent and they stand for principles. And he said, I never have had any trouble with any of them. And I said, thank you very much, sir. That's the best commendation I can get. I want to tell you that Christ in the heart makes all the difference. You can't do what's wrong when Christ is in your heart and you're willing to be obedient to his perfect and blessed will. And you know, Christians who know the Lord, they're not miserable. I tell you, I'm not miserable. I'm accused of laughing far too much. And... Uh, yeah, some time ago in the, <laughs> in the House of Commons we had a fairly rough debate. We do have some rough debates in the House of Commons. And uh, <laughs> some Labour members of Parliament come across the floor of the House to speak to me afterwards. They didn't like what I'd said. And I was sending them. But I really laughed because there was a, a Tory member of the House. I, I never heard him uh, really taking sides in anything in the House. And he was standing beside me and I was answering these men and giving them for all of they gave me, I gave them uh, good measure pressed together, shaken together and running over. And he kept saying, shouting out, Give it to the man! Give it to the man! Give it to the And I said after it was over, I said, you, you broke out tonight. Never happened yet. You know, we've got to stand up for Jesus. He's God is looking for people who will know that the Lord's looking at them. It says the Lord saw that it was good. How blessed it must be when the Lord looks down and sees of the travail of a soul and the hearts of his own people. And know they're seeking to obey his word and to do his will. And then would you please notice and come now to the end of this. It says at the end of this, it says this, the evening and the morning were the first day. Now that's not the day of man. That's the day of God. Our day ends in the evening. When we go out into the night. God's day finishes in the morning finishes in the light. Our eyes are not towards the evening of darkness, but the light of the morning. And we will, as we proceed down the road of light, learn to appreciate every day that our eyes are towards the light. The light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I came to know Christ as a young boy in Sabbath school. I've been a long time on the road. I've been in many strange places. I'm a jailbird. I've been locked away three times. I don't know how soon I'll go in again. And all I can say to you, in sorrow he's my trouble. In sorrow he's my help. He tells me every care in him to rule. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. I want to introduce you to my friend, the blessed Lord Jesus Christ. Put your hand in his kneel pierced hand. Go to his cross and kneel there and see the precious blood flow for your redemption. And cry out with that poor sinner, Lord, be merciful.
to be the sinner. Something will happen. Your life will be changed. Your home will be rearranged since Jesus comes into your heart. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. He will save you. Hallelujah. He will save you now. May God bless these words to our heart. Amen.